Hey there, my name is Cassie Torresias, and eight years ago, I launched my own online graphic design studio and booked a one-way ticket to travel the world in pursuit of my own freedom-filled life. I now own a multi-million dollar online business, The Bucket List Bombshells, teaching other women how to do the same, alongside my best friend, co-founder, and podcast co-host, Shay Brown. Around here, we believe that your crazy dreams aren't crazy, and that it's time for you to start creating the life and career that you dream about too. Whether you want to travel and work remotely, or simply just want to be your own boss, it's possible to live out your passion and purpose without just scraping by. We know that this path isn't always easy to navigate though, so we're here to help you. From making a career change, starting and growing your own business, balancing life and business, and most importantly, pursuing your own freedom-filled life. Get ready for real, relatable stories and advice on your journey towards something more. We serve it up BFF style, so pour yourself that third cup of coffee and let's dive in. Welcome to the Freedom Filled Life Podcast. Hey everyone, it's Cassie here. Welcome back to the first episode of the Freedom Filled Life Podcast in 2022. Shay and I are kicking things off today with a super fun and casual Ask Us Anything episode where we rounded up some of the most popular questions that you've sent over in the past week and we're going to be diving into answering those in today's episode. In our conversation today, Shay and I are giving you a life and business update, what we've been up to since the new year, along with talking about everything from what a typical workday looks like for us right now, our current morning routine, advice for you to connect and network when you've been isolated for so long, how to make a pivot in your business right now, and even advice for those of you wanting to get inspiration to pick back up on your dreams after these past two years have been full of constant change and drained energy. Today's episode is raw and real. We hope you enjoy it. Let's dive in. Hey Shay, it's official first podcast episode back of 2022. Oh, I love it. So excited to be back fresh in the new year. You know, I love a fresh start. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So rejuvenated. And for all of you guys that followed along in 2021, thank you for giving us and our team some time to rest, rejuvenate. I feel like we all needed an extra holiday season this year, Mm, but it does feel so good to be back. Mm -hmm. Uh, Quick little life recap or life update since our last episodes. I recently moved not that far, just a little bit up the coast to a tiny little town in California called San Clemente. So if you live in San Clemente and you want to hang out, (laughs) let me know. But it's been nice to make a little move and it feels good. And what about you, Shay? Yeah, I'm still in Playa del Carmen in Mexico, which I think I shared on a couple episodes ago. So I'm still here. So if you are in town, let me know. I know there's been tons of people coming through Cancun and Playa del Carmen is just an hour away from that. So hit me up for a little coffee date. I'm here. On the business side, we have been working super, super hard behind the scenes with our team on creating something totally new, um, something that we've never done before. So there's that kind of like nervous excitement in my stomach. So make sure that you're receiving emails from us. You can always email us at hello at bucketlistbombshells.com. Make sure that you're receiving emails from us to be the first to know. We are going to be making some big announcements next week officially. So that's been really fun to be working on behind the scenes. And you're definitely going to want to be in on what's up our sleeve for 2022. So let's jump into today's official episode, which is fun because it's our first ask us anything or ask me anything. I've been calling it AMAs, but I realized that since there's two of us, it's now (laughs) AUA. So we have picked some of the top questions that came in from Instagram and from some of our student communities, emails, et cetera. If you were one of the people who responded, then thank you. 
But we thought it would be really cool to kind of just kick off the year with this episode that kind of touches on a lot of different things that you guys are asking and gives, like I said earlier, just a little recap of what's been going on around here. So a lot of the questions too are quite similar or some anyway. So then we tend to kind of just combine those. So again, this is just like a recap of some of the top questions that have come in. And as we were reviewing them earlier, Shay, a lot of these questions I feel like are questions we get asked pretty regularly as well. So it's nice to be able to answer them all in one episode here. All in one. I like it. Yes. It's very, they were all very common. And I was like, all right, people want to know the same thing year after year. We got this. (laughs) Okay, cool. So let's kick it off. Our first question is from Monica and she asks, what does a typical work day look like for you? Yeah, I love this question. It actually goes back kind of to routines and creating work-life balance. So I know we talked a lot about this in episode two, how to create your version of work-life balance. So I encourage you to check that out for like a more in-depth kind of perspective on how we schedule our days. But when it comes to like Mm -hmm. a typical work day, for me, I like to have a bit of a routine (laughs) to my mornings. And lately my typical day looks like getting started with a workout and a meditation and a prayer and then eating a really yummy breakfast, getting myself fueled up for the day and then popping in and just like chunking out my work. So I really like to look at my task list and I really like to group things together, even sometimes by day. So if it's like a theme, maybe this today I'm working on like everything that has to do with like one particular area of the business, or Mm -hmm. if it's a little bit different, I like to just sort of gather them together and be like, okay, I'm going to do little blocks throughout my day. And then like take my rest days, rest time (laughs) throughout the day, my snack time. I'm a big proponent of continuing to keep your blood sugar levels on par. (laughs) So I'm a snacker and I usually end my day around like five, six, which actually I think sounds a little bit more traditional than most people think I spend my days, Mm -hmm. but I really love just like kicking off the day, getting into my work and then like being able to have my evenings free for like social and hobby times. I love that you referenced back to episode two, because I do think that is so indicative of how different you and I's work schedule looks like sometimes, even though we have like very similar things that we are working on. But in that episode, we also talk about how our typical work days have you know, changed based off Mm. of the location or just based off of the season that we're in. So I think that's something that's really important to keep in mind for you. Like if your typical work day or day is looking different than it was somewhere else, I think one of the things we talked about in that episode is how we really like to create our typical day or work day based off of the things that we value. And so that's what you'll see kind of like when you were just sharing are the things that pop up in our day. For me right now in my season, I feel like I've been prioritizing lots of rest. I feel like with so much change that has been going on and continues to go on, I find that like the more rested I am, (laughs) and this is like ever since I was like literally a child, like two years old, (laughs) like I have a lot of energy, but if I do not get a good night's sleep, it's not that great. (laughs) So I've been prioritizing lots of rest and I feel like extra rest as well. And so my typical work day looks like not, I don't set my alarm in the morning at all, which usually means I wake up roughly between the seven to nine 30 realm, which is a pretty big window. (laughs) I know it's a big window, but what I love is I feel like I talked about this in that episode too. I feel like it gives, it allows my body to get what it needs. Like sometimes I, my eyes pop open and it's seven 30 and I feel like I'm like, boom, let's, let's go. Let's make coffee and get this day started. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I struggle to get out of bed at 945. So that's just, I feel like for me, that allows my body the balance it needs. Typically right now I've been starting work at 10 AM, which sounds kind of so mind blowing to me because (laughs) my typical work day has looked so different in Mm -hmm. other seasons where like I'm waking up at 630. (laughs) So right now I'm starting work at 10 AM. And before that, I similar to Shay, I'm doing making my coffee, making my French press, and then doing some morning journaling and kind of like prayer time, devotional time before I jump into work. And then I'm usually at the gym sometime in the afternoon, like around three ish somewhere in there 
try to get in there before like all the after work crowd <laughs> gets in. But I also feel like it is just like a really nice breakup of my day. Like if we have been working super hard and on, you know, intensive brain energy things from 10 a.m. Usually after lunch and it hits 3 p.m. and I'm like, OK, my brain needs a break. So usually hit the gym and then also wrapping up i mean it kind of depends i'm not usually doing a whole lot when i get back so i feel like my days are pretty you know that's like a solid six hour work day and i feel like right now for me that seems like that's plenty usually by the time i get back from the gym and like you know start thinking about dinner and stuff i'm like okay my brain feels like it's like maxed out for the day so like i said it just changes so differently in different seasons which is kind of cool to chat about right now because i feel like yeah. this season is so different than it has been in the past yeah definitely definitely it sounds like you're having lots of rest in the mornings and in the afternoons but then like having that like super solid just like focused work time like I love it I think it's just so great to have different seasons in life like I feel mm -hmm. like for me, that's really consistent. <laughs> like <laughs> I tend to forget that there's like what's going. And I think I take a cue from you a lot of time when I'm like mm -hmm. adjusting my schedule to work mm -hmm. for me instead of always forcing me to be in my schedule. That's been like a really mm -hmm. big growth area for me. And mm -hmm. you would be surprised to learn. Actually, this is something Cass doesn't know. I stopped using an alarm like two <laughs> <weeks> ago. <laughs> no way. Oh yeah. my goodness. I know. But I wake up at 7.30 like every single morning on the dot. So I'm sorry, my body is even in routine still. Like how hilarious is that? You were like 7.30 to 9.30, 7 to 9.30. And I was like, oh my gosh, I literally still wake up at 7.30 every morning. So just thought that'd be a little fun thing to share too. <laughs> Congratulations on ditching the alarm. We're all so proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> um, that's very similar to the question that Anna sent in and mm -hmm. she said, what is your morning routine like? I feel like we kind of already touched on that and it is very similar to our typical work day in that or at least for me anyways like I said, it has changed in terms of like where I'm at, I guess, but I feel like I always end up coming back to something very similar. Mm -hmm. We love to talk about rhythms and having these rhythms and making sure that your routines are based on your values. And so that is something I feel like that it changes where it is, but I feel like mm -hmm. it, it does have some consistency. So for me, I like to have some blocked time, I would say like roughly an hour of like what I consider a slow morning. And it doesn't, it's not really that I'm still waking up. It's just, I really love to be like intentional. And I like that I don't have to like be on like my brain, my business brain doesn't need to be on right away from like the moment I wake up. I think that's a very common thing for like newer business owners. And I've struggled with this, you know, years ago in the earlier days of our business or even in like intense growth seasons where the moment my eyes open, I'm like looking at my emails and looking at Slack messages and I'm like, okay, like I gotta go, like you already feel behind. And so one of the things I really love that I get a lot out of is having that intentional, like one hour of a slow morning. And so I make my coffee and right now that just looks like, you know, cozying up on my couch, having my coffee, having like my, you know, window open, listening to worship music or some music that you love in the morning and then setting kind of like intentions for the day. And, you know, I feel like that really, especially now, you know, maybe in the past I could skip a week or two on end and it wasn't as big of a deal, but I feel like especially now that's something that has really added a lot of I would say stability to mm. my days. And I think anytime that you can be intentional with your morning routine or find ways to like sneak those things in, it's so, so important. So I've had, I've, I like to experiment, which you guys will <laughs> hear if you listen to episode two as well. And so I think that you know, if you're like, okay, I need to build a morning routine. I want to find something that works for me. I think starting simple like that, mm -hmm. even for me recently, I'm like, okay, I want to be able to like get outside in more, more, my morning routine, mm -hmm. you know, considering like going for a walk by the beach or something like that. So I feel like you can kind of like layer on as well mm -hmm. for someone like you, Shay, you love to have that like consistent every day looks the same. And I think for me, I'm kind of like, okay, maybe some mornings I do get out to the beach and some mornings I don't, but yeah, I feel like it's, it's maintained that consistency more or less. That seems to be what we always come back to. Yeah, I would agree with that. Even in like 
there's things that I'll change, even if I do like to have the same, like we're talking about seasons, like for a while I wasn't working out in the morning and, you know, I've added that back in, but you were talking about sort of that anchoring activity Mm -hmm. or ritual or routine rhythm that you do. And for me, it's very similar. As long as I do like at least just a 10 minute, even I noticed even just doing a 10 minute journal, which is basically my way of prayer and my way of meditation and my way of gratitude. Those are the three areas I journal about. And as long as I'm Mm -hmm. spending at least 10 minutes in my morning, it actually makes like a significant difference. So I actually tested this on myself recently and I did a week where I didn't do it. And I did a week where I did it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's placebo effect or not, but I would like to (laughs) think it's not, you know, like you gotta like as a hypothesis, you got to remember there's that too, or scientists. But when I did it, I did notice a significant change in my mental state throughout the day versus the days I didn't do it. So I'm really Mm. utilizing that as my, I've always done it, but I sort of am now I'm doing it even with more intentionality to like knowing Mm. that it has an effect on me in a way. And then the other stuff is I love consistency. And then I've learned though in some seasons, like there was a season for a while that I just like was not motivated to work out in the morning. And it was really a a learning experience for me to give myself grace in that moment and just say, okay, that's fine. Like just go for a walk. Or like, for me, I love going outside my home to do my journaling or my morning routine. And it's going to a cafe and getting coffee and just being kind of like feeling the energy of the morning. Mm. Like I find morning people are like that in between, like people are kind of like motivated to get their day started, but they're not like the afternoon I find is very buzzy in a cafe. Mm. And my morning peeps are like me. We're like, we're like motivated. We're here, but we're like chill. So that's like, (laughs) I love starting my day. (laughs) So yeah, I love it. Lots of good. We always have so much to say about morning routines. (laughs) And I think it's just, I I do think it's really important. And I know it's become like more and more of this like hyped up, you know, conversation. And there's, you know, I I do think at the end of the day, it is so much like what is working for you. Your morning routine is going to look so different if you have kids or Mm -hmm. based off of where you are, your location. And I think something that you just touched upon too, which I love is like experimenting. You know, if you haven't found a morning routine that works for you, I would say make sure that you figure out your intentions and your values. Mm -hmm. I think that is a big part of like just setting yourself up for the day. Like you want to Mm -hmm. be working or or doing your day in purpose. Even Mm -hmm. I think for people that I know that are like a stay at home mom, like there's so much purpose in that too. And when you can carve out some time for yourself and make sure that you're showing up in your day with purpose, whatever it is that you're doing, doesn't matter if you're in a nine to five or starting your own business or, you know, you've been running your business for a long time. I think any time that you can set your day with purpose Mm -hmm. is going to be absolutely key. Yeah, so much good stuff there. Well, this entire conversation could just be about morning routines. So let's continue on with these with these questions. The next question came in from Steph and she asked, how do you connect and network with other people when you've been isolated for so long? I think a lot of people asking, I feel like I was asking this, you know, a, a six months ago or, or so when there was more restrictions around the area that I was living in. And it was like, how do I connect with other like-minded people? How do I connect specifically with other entrepreneurs? Because I feel mm-hmm. like when we used to have a more travel-based lifestyle, especially when we were in Bali, it was like built-in communities, especially around co-working spaces that made that mm-hmm. a part of it so easy. And I think we, over the past like two years, now, which sounds so long, two years now, we've all kind of had to make adjustments and figure out new ways of doing it. So this is going to be kind of a typical answer, but it's going online. Everybody is somewhere online. And I think it's figuring out where those people are again, kind of like, what is it that you're looking for? Who are you looking to connect with and network Mm. with? And where are they spending some time online? There's so many new things that have popped up, so many new Mm. social groups, so many new websites and different types of ways or online communities to Mm. connect with one another. And I would say that first kind of setting that intention around who am I looking for to connect with and where could they possibly be hanging out? So doing a little research and then Mm. getting connected and integrated and sort of putting yourself out there. I know online, sometimes it's harder to connect, um, but just inviting someone to a Zoom, trying to do like some more face-to-face in-person connection connections. Mm. And then if your local community allows for it, I know there are a lot of people feeling that way, looking for connection and are, you know, doing meetups and stuff like that locally as well. So again, it's just kind of figuring out where those are, I think, and utilizing online researching, but understanding like 
who, what type of person are you looking to connect with? Yeah, I think that's a great point because still when you're thinking about networking or or connecting, there is still like some common thread usually, right? Like mm-hmm. you can connect, you know, online over comedy. Like my partner did an online comedy workshop or you can connect over business or there's so many different things, especially like you were saying, Shay, online now that we're very typically in person. And so I think recognizing like, okay, what are your hobbies? What are the things you're interested in and talking about or doing? And then finding maybe workshops or courses or ways that you can connect with people in that regard. One of my really good friends is super interested in like personal development and she has been doing this course or kind of like virtual program with other women on personal development. I think there's like a theme involved there. So like there's so much out there, but for me, one of the things that came up even with this question is like, it's because a lot of us or a lot of people feel so tired because of the last two years, right? Like you're tired of being isolated but at the same time, whether you're still have restrictions or not, it's easy to just be comfortable and stick with what we were supposed to do for so long, which was like stay home. And you know, you do like Netflix, <laughs> you just like, you stay home and you Netflix and you cook, right? We were like all doing this early, early days of of COVID. And I think that most humans, like we don't like change, yet we are at our core built to adapt and built to change. But I think the longer that things go on, you feel like you want to connect and you want to network, but you're just like, like it feels tiring or maybe you're like I don't want to get back on zoom Mm -hmm. or like where do I find people and you're just like, you know what, it just becomes so much easier to binge watch an entire season of Ozark like I just did last week versus like putting yourself out there again. And I think that, you know, as you're doing these things that Shay is mentioning too, whether it's virtual or in person, kind of depending on uh, where you're located, I think recognizing that most likely you're going to feel those like awkward baby steps again, you know, it's going to feel like awkward and weird to like, just even have small talk again with people, or it's going to feel awkward and weird to be like around other people you know, even for myself, someone who's like super extroverted, it still feels kind of like awkward and weird when I like meet up with new, with new people again, because it's just, it's, it's been so long, right? So I think remembering that that's super normal, like anytime that it's been a while since you've done something, you know, there's going to be those awkward baby steps. But I do feel like it kind of becomes that like, you know, knowing how to ride a bike thing, like it does end up, you forget, thinking about it like oh this is awkward this is weird I haven't done this so long like how do I act around people (laughs) and it becomes this natural like you fall into a rhythm again of like oh yeah we are meant to do life with people whether you're connecting with people virtually or you're in person like we are meant to do life with people and we're not meant to be isolated and so I think trying to you know, start small, it can seem like, oh my gosh, like now, you know, maybe your word of the year is connect and you want to do all these connection things. It's probably going to feel energy draining as well. Like even maybe doing one activity or one workshop. I think when we have these big ideas and big goals or visions for what we want, if you want to get connected back into community, I think that it can start as small as one baby step, you know, like who is one person that you can reach out to this week and reconnect with, or you know, maybe it's someone you don't know, someone that you've been Instagram friends with for a while, reach out to that one person and see if they're, you know, willing to do a a Zoom coffee chat or meet up in person. And then I think it snowballs from there. You start to get that, again, I don't know if it's like an extroverted thing, but like I start to get like more energy, like it's a snowball effect because I get energized by people. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like what took me so long to just show up to this meetup? I had recently moved to San Diego and I didn't really have any network or connections there. And they had a women's entrepreneur group, like San Diego women's entrepreneurship, something along those lines, business owners. And it did, it felt so weird to be like, okay, I'm going to take time out of my Wednesday to like go and introduce myself. And you know, you never really know, like, are you going to meet people that are going to be your people? And it's really like so much easier than I think we make it out to be in our heads. And I think the more that you choose to show up and kind of put yourself in uncomfortable situations, especially since we've been isolated for so long, like you're bound to meet one person or make one connection and you'll 
you'll realize like, oh my gosh, I need to keep doing this. You know, we're meant to be in connection with each other. So that's kind of my take on connecting and networking. And as, as much as I'm kind of tossing out advice right now, I think it's advice I'm also sharing for myself, just moving to a new place too. And you have also done this recently. It's kind of like another layer, like, okay, we've been isolated for so long and now you move to a new city or in your case, a totally new country. And then on top of that, you're like, okay, great. Connecting and networking still in a pandemic. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That was such a great perspective. And I just want to say that I've actually feel like I've experienced what you just shared. Like when I moved here to Playa again, I made new friends and it was kind of awkward and it did feel weird. And then it kind of snowballed though. So I have friends, a community built here over time now. And then I also have recently reconnected with, because you had mentioned reconnection. I actually have recently reconnected with a couple of my online entrepreneur friends who are also living in different parts of the country. And I just felt like, and we had been, you know, chatting over the past, past couple of years, but we really hadn't made that intentional effort to like regularly connect. And I mean, a friend of mine were just talking about how it would just felt, we just felt too tired. We just felt like we just like, couldn't show up. We just felt a little exhausted. We didn't also feel like we wanted to show up as like our not best selves, so to speak. And that's something I've been trying to get over to. Like I actually have regular conversations about it, even with my friends here, just like showing up as your real self, instead of being like, okay, I can't attend this or I can't do this because I'm feeling, you know, a little awkward today or a little more tired today or a little bit, you know, it's just more acknowledging that and then saying, Hey, I still want connection. So like, I don't have to be my like perfect self, especially when it's, when it comes to like close friends of yours or, or good connections. And it was so interesting how we had both sort of fallen into that pattern with each other. And then when we ended up having a conversation, we ended up having like a three hour FaceTime catch up and it felt like no time had passed at all. And it just was so refreshing to just be like, yeah, like I was feeling that way too. You're feeling, but now we sort of are just putting ourselves back out there. And like you said, the snowball effect has really like just even happened in my own life. And I just, yeah, I love that. I love that perspective that you shared. Yeah, I think it's great. I'm, I think that's a great question too that, that Steph asked because I think when we feel isolated too, like because you're isolated, you feel like maybe I'm the only one, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm the only one that's been so disconnected. Maybe everyone else is like freaking FaceTiming their family and friends every single day and this and that. And you're like, I'm just the only one over here that's withdrawn, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I totally agree with you. I think a lot of people have felt tired and with so much change, it's like sometimes you don't feel like you had the energy to just have the these like catch up sessions uh, mm -hmm. with people that you used to in the past. So I think it's a really great reminder. And I love that you've reconnected with people. I think it's a great reminder for people that have been your people that, that you have maybe lost some touch with or connection with over the past year or two. I think recognizing that like most likely that was also the same case on their side rather than just being like, you know, someone has you know, no longer cares or is like too busy or, you know, whatever kind of stories we, we play in our head, I think is a really great reminder. It seems to be just like a collective yeah. feeling or way that, you know, some of us have dealt with community or lack of it for the past two years. So I'm glad we're yeah. talking about that. Well, shifting gears a little bit, our next question came in from Beatrice and she asked, can you share some advice for first timers taking the plunge with a ton of passion, but no path? Well, I think most people take a plunge because of passion first. <laughs> and I think that's a really great place to start. You know, the fact that you are doing something with intention of doing something that you love, I think means that you are going to do whatever it takes to make that happen. You know, the path, obviously there is like some path out there and I think the path is important, but I think it's more important that you start taking, you just start taking steps. You know, maybe I'm not exactly sure what it is that you're doing, but obviously with the internet now, it's very easy to with a quick Google search, you can find some steps or some outline to achieve whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. But I think from our experience, the reality of that is everyone's journey and experience is so different. And there's only so much still that you can gather by someone saying, you know, here's the eight point path to get you where you need to go. There is so much that still needs to be filled in between the lines. And I think that is the doing and that is actually taking action. And so the more that you can, you know, with your passion, 
start to take action on step one and learn. And even if you make a mistake, gather those things as learning lessons and move on to step two and move on to step three. I think it's much less actually about the path you know we you and i didn't even know not only did we not know the path we didn't even have the full full vision of where we wanted to go on day one and the more that you start to take action and kind of step through one door another door opens right like if you were to see kind of the whole path of like 50 doors ahead of you it would seem super exhausting like and super time consuming and that's just like not you know that's just not really the way a life happens or i feel like you know even in this context the way business happens as well right like there are things that change and shift and one door and one opportunity leads to another door and another opportunity and so i think that I do think that this this stage of following what it is that you're passionate passionate about or following what it is that you love and taking that plunge is actually the more common way and the 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 higher likelihood for success because I think if you were doing it the other way around and someone had given you a path maybe you know you're doing it only strictly for financial reasons like someone said here is this path to like achieve this level of financial success and you're not passionate about it it is going to be so much more of an uphill battle and so much more of a struggle to continue to wake up day in and day out and knowing that you're going to make mistakes, knowing that not everything is going to go as planned and then be able to kind of get back up and keep going. I think that's where passion needs to be part of the equation. The more that you have passion for something and as long as you take action on it, I think that's another piece I would say when you're going to take the plunge, like you got to take action. I think also finding other people that you can follow that have done something similar is also another way that you can learn just such great advice and you know, it's very meta to share like podcasting, but there are podcasts on so many different topics and there's so much that you can learn from other people's experiences, which I think is what podcasting is all about. So whatever it is that you are passionate about, for example, I am really into and passionate about like home renovations. I've never renovated a home myself, but there are podcasts where people share the lessons that they've learned and things that they've done being first time home renovators. And there's so much that I can learn from that and it doesn't even cost me a dime. So that would be my advice there. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And I really think that just putting one foot in front of the other reveals the path. And I know that if you're a type mm-hmm. A, that's like, super frustrating advice (laughs) (laughs) as I wanted the plan. And now because of experience, because of just learning and doing everything that Kat said, so like learning first and then taking action second and just taking action sometimes a little, I don't want to say blindly, but a little bit with like trusting or faith or the passion, like taking a step with passion and saying, I want to do this is what revealed the path for us. And like Cass said, that with the multiple doors, I think that if you have the path too defined, and I feel like I've done this before, mm-hmm. having creating a path that's too defined, that when a door presents itself, that is the opportunity. I didn't walk through it because I was so intensely focused on a specific path I created or mm-hmm. that I saw someone else doing and felt like that's what I needed to do. That's what we needed to follow. Mm-hmm. And eventually the opportunity came back around and I was able to, oh, you know, go through that door. But I felt like I missed some of those along the way that I could have opened the doors to those sooner if I just allowed my passion to fuel me versus the plan to necessarily fuel you. Mm. Yeah, there is like some version of a quote that I'm probably going to like mess up, but it's basically like being committed to the vision or to the goal that you have, but being flexible in the path to get there. Because at the end of the day, like the goal or the vision is what you're trying to achieve. And we know that the path is going to change or we know that there, just like you're sharing, there are multiple ways to do this thing. And 
especially if it's a thing that you've never done before, maybe you start going along the path and you realize that there's a better way of doing it or a different way of doing it that you want to try. And so I think like you had shared, if you are so committed to this version of the path, it's not going to allow you the flexibility of just like experience or life or learnings when at the end of the day, you just want to be committed to the vision or the goal. And that is the thing that's driving you forward, the path itself to get there, even the time it might take to get there in the very beginning it's all like a, it's a plan it's a it's theoretical right but those those things alter and change as as life happens as business happens as you shared as you you know meet someone or a door opens and so i think that that's like the advice that we would share kind of following a similar path that that we did we were super super passionate about teaching women how to have online skills and work remotely that was the goal like how can we make sure that as many women around the world know about this path of opportunity and that they can create just so much freedom in their lives in whatever way that looks like for them. There is no path <laughs> when we share that vision, right? Like there's not a path in our minds. We, and there was an, a door of opportunity where we had learned about online courses. And that seemed to be like a really amazing way to share our expertise with as many women as possible. And so, you know, we built that first course, but it, it's all very much just like stepping stones and, and then something else presents itself. So yeah, I think it was a great, very relatable question too. And I'm glad that you're taking a plunge with passion and no path, because I actually think that that's I actually think that's not as detrimental as you might think. <laughs> All right. The next question comes in from Lonnie and she asks, what was it like starting out for you? And what did you have to endure to be successful? Oh, I like this endure. It sounds yeah. so like, I just see us like in this treacherous like yeah, waves, like, like enduring whew. success. Yeah. I mean, it kind of relates back to what we were just talking about in terms of like when, what it was like just starting out, it was full of passion and, and purpose and an idea and a concept and seeing the vision and just, yeah, allowing doors to come our way and kind of figuring out what, how we, what door we were going to take. And in, in, in our case, we decided to build an online course. And I think just starting out was really exciting and really like passion driven. And then along the way, we learned that in that you start to learn when you're running an online business, that there's also a lot of strategic thinking that needs to come along with that as well. And I think that um, kind of playing off of the passion and then taking the steps forward and the path revealing itself when we were just starting out, it was so passion filled and we had this concept and these ideas. And then when it got down to actually sharing it with the world and deciding to do that through a course and through starting a business, you know, then there's that next step in that path where you're like, okay, well, how do I market and sell something like this? How do I even create it with the content so that the content can be received? And we we're actually learning how to teach someone these concepts and just I think it again became and when you're just starting out like became of lots of learning like lots and lots of learning and then lots of implementing and trying out what works and then finding the things that work is what made us successful because we were willing to experiment and we were willing to try different things and we were willing to pave our carve our own path and yes look at what other people were doing but also decide what we wanted to do um, there weren't a lot of people in our industry and that might be the same for you whatever you're creating, um, is that there might not be other people to necessarily look to. Like we had some in terms of like online course creation, but in terms of even our topic or a type of business or like as a lifestyle business and a brand, it was really us just deciding, um, what we wanted to do and then finding out whether or not that worked and then listening to our audience and providing what they wanted along the way. And I feel like that's how we were became, you know, quote unquote successful. And I think that successful is defined uh, at an individual level as well. I think it's really great because that was something that came to mind is like success, like this quote unquote success. I think our vision of success has changed mm -hmm. over the years. And I think it's changed based off of what we've wanted and what we have sometimes even things that we have achieved and realized that's not exactly what we had thought that that was going to be like. And so, you know, that kind of shifts your path a little and like, what if, what if this is more of our version of success? And so I think that has definitely changed over the years. And as you grow as individuals, you know, if it's been almost a decade of running a business or running bucket list bombshells, that means it's a decade of our personal growth as well. And of course, like if we were all like, 
what we wanted when we were 20, um, which not to say that that's a bad thing if it's the same, but most likely the things that you wanted when you were 20 versus the things that you wanted when you were like 15 are quite different. And so I think what we've wanted, what our, our version of success has also kind of adapted in that way too. There's this amazing quote that I love and it says successful people see failure as a temporary setback and unsuccessful people see it as a mark on their character. And that was kind of the first thing that came to mind when it was like, what did you have to endure to be successful? I think really recognizing like for someone who like we, you and I are both very competitive and we love getting things right. And we love planning and we love, you know, quote unquote success, doing things and seeing the success out of it. And I think in that process too, is recognizing that, and maybe you don't really come in, like, you know, this on like, some logical level but like really like feeling this deep in your soul to know like if you make a mistake or quote unquote fail or something doesn't go as planned which is highly 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 likely anytime you are paving your own path right like mm -hmm. You don't set out to this path, whether it's to start a business and you're like, every single thing that I plan is all going to go according to plan and there's not going to be any setbacks and I'm like, I'm never going to mess up because spoiler alert, that's just not how it works. It's just not how life works, right? Like, I also think that we lose just so much lessons and learnings from those failure, quote unquote failures, you know? I think it's an amazing quote from someone I, you know, really, really, really admire and who has just like seen so much in his day and time of life and, and business and is super successful. And it's like, you see failure as a temporary setback. And I think that is something that I, in partly having this podcast in, in itself is something I think that needs to be shared just on a broader scale, right? We've talked about this in past episodes. Like it's very easy to see, we see the transformations and we love the transformation stories. Like you see the ugly duckling and then it gets transformed and you're like, wow. But like so often we forget to talk about the middle. And this was a conversation you and I were having recently. It's like, we both despise this messy middle like I and I and now that I can like call it out you know and Brene Brown talks about the messy middle so this is not like something that we we just came up with but I think it identifies and puts language so perfectly to that middle ground where you are too far to like turn back around because you think like I've already invested so much time and energy or like I've already made this commitment or like I've already started and like you still want to quote unquote finish or see this thing through yet you're still far enough from actually seeing the thing through that like this middle ground still is like you kind of are like oh like why did i do this you know i think in the renovation shows that i watch it's that like people love to start the renovation because they have this vision right you see all of these beautiful renditions of like what this house is going to look like and it's this person's dream house and then in the middle of the episode you see them walk into the house when like all the walls have been torn down that's where like all the rubble has been uncovered you know you start to figure out like there's leaks or there's like asbestos or there's like this in this wall that you thought you were going to be able to tear down and like now this is going to be super expensive because if you want to take down this wall like it's actually holding up half the house and like that period this messy middle in whatever it is that we're doing that's what requires us to like dig deep find solutions reassess our path like we were talking about earlier and I think for a lot of us in this day and age where we have Amazon Prime, like Amazon Prime now, you want like everything now, this instant, we have instant gratification. You wanna just be able to like click a button and solve this thing, right? We have like just so much instant gratification. That's not, in my opinion, from what I've seen in my own experience and what we've seen from, you know, a lot of mentors that we know or other successful people that we like have chatted with. That's not really where their success came from at all, right? Like it came from from those messy middle it could have been months it could have been messy middle years and you dug in and decided to reassess or rechange things but keep going and i think you and i often see in this industry that we're in especially working with so many women who are you know aspiring 
business owners. You know, there's something so beautiful about being an aspiring business owner, having a vision or having a dream, but then it becomes so easy to give up when you start, you like had all this energy to get started and you were like so excited and like doo -doo -doo -doo, making all these moves. And then like you hit your first roadblock. We see this all the time. Like you get your first no from a client or, you know, you do one client project and like, it doesn't exactly work out the way you planned. And like it all of a sudden feels like all the walls are caving in to people. Like, it's like, maybe I'm not meant to do this. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe I don't have enough confidence. It's like an immediate flip of a switch instead of recognizing that like that is still where you're learning you know that's still where you're like okay why did i think my first client was supposed to go like you know swimmingly or like amazing as planned it's like okay now i know that i want to implement this into my process or now i know what i don't want in a client or now i recognize what some red flags are that was very much how you and i approached the start of our business it was very much like something doesn't work out like okay let's figure out how to make it work out like let's figure out a better way and so i think this like this messy middle is just like so underrated to be honest because that's really where you are gonna then see these people who come out the other side right like we know so many stories like there's so many netflix documentaries now too with like michael jordan and like i watched this amazing i think it was like a documentary of kurt warner who's like this incredible nfl quarterback and like the store, the real stories of how they got there, which I had zero clue, by the way, like you just see them like, woo, like raising the Super Bowl trophy. And you're like, wow, that's so amazing. Like, I just assumed that, you know, the path to get there, obviously hard work was involved, but like how amazing that they're the successful, you know, person or athlete or business owner or whatever. You just see the moments where people are raising the trophy and then you hear all these other pieces of the stories and you're like, oh my gosh, this person got rejected like over and over over and over and over again. Like so many times that even when I watch some of these documentaries, I'm like, like maybe you should just like, maybe that's like not gonna work out for you. You know, like I do, it's so strange because obviously I, you know, want people to accomplish their dreams, but you, it is, it's that kind of like the logic side, right? Like the logic comes in and you're just like, dude, it's not working out. Like you just like give up, but like that's not gonna work or maybe that dream isn't meant for you or whatever, right? And so I think that making, sure that when we're talking about this, like, what do you have to endure to be successful? I think that sounds very dramatic. Um, and I think there's still a lot of positive things that can be learned, but you know, not forgetting or overlooking or just being like, oh yeah, this person had a setback and like, then they kept going. Like you are going to face those trials, tribulations, setbacks, roadblocks, rubble, whatever it is you wanna call it. And whether you're going to make it to the other side, I think is how we choose to show up in the messy middle. We have lots of episodes too, where we go into way more depth of, you know, our origin story and our, some failures that we face in our business. So if you want to know more about that, we have episode one, which is the Buckleless Bombshells origin story and very much, you know, how we came up with the idea for Buckleless Bombshells and, you know, what ultimately made us book a one-way ticket when we didn't know each other. Episode three is one of the biggest failures we faced in our business very early on. So this is like perfect for this conversation, how we overcame that. Episode four is landing our first clients and overcoming that imposter syndrome, which I think is really great for people who are in those early days of finding your first clients or maybe getting rejected and trying to get your client roster. So, all right, let's keep going here. We have a question from Carrie and she said, how do you make progress and stay motivated? I think when it comes to making progress, it definitely goes back to like kind of something I talked about earlier on with like time blocking out my calendar, but mm -hmm. just more so making progress is to me looking at like the week ahead, what is it on my to-do list and what are the, this is a concept called the MIT concept where it's like, what are my most important tasks and how can I accomplish my most important tasks in my 
best optimal time of my day. So whether you're an evening person, a morning person, an afternoon worker, whenever you're, you feel your best at producing, you're going to make the most progress in those timeframes. And so I recommend just figuring that out for yourself, but then also always focusing, especially when you first sit down to start something, focusing on the most important tasks. So usually that's three things that you can accomplish today. And instead mm-hmm. of these crazy long to-do lists that we make for ourselves and make, and it makes us feel like we are making progress if we're able to check all of those things off. But if you really evaluated your to-do list and sort of removed the things that are not the things that are going to propel you forward, whether that's in your business or or at work or on a certain project, the things that are actually going to propel and make a difference at pushing that project forward are Mm -hmm. the things that you should focus on in terms of making progress. Because in my opinion, that's what's going to keep you motivated. So Mm -hmm. when you feel like you're making accomplishments, you are going to feel motivated to continue to reward yourself with feeling accomplished. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I make progress and stay motivated. Mm, I love that. I think for me too, I, one way that I like to stay motivated is to stay focused on like what my bigger goal or like bigger perspective is like, what am I doing all this work for? Like, what am I driving towards? Whether it's something in my life or something in business or something that you want to achieve, like whatever that goal is. I think the more that you can stay connected to that vision, I think it helps kind of like what you were sharing earlier, Shay, it helps if you can revisit that every day, you know, maybe that is part of your morning routine. And so that you are making progress, but it's not making progress for the sake of progress, right? We're not just like working to be busy or like hustling to hustle. Like there is, there's purpose behind that. And so I think for me, it's very twofold. I love to make progress as well. Like she said, I love to be able to like check like a big thing that I know is going to move something forward on my to-do list. And when that is combined with like, okay, like that's going to get me one step closer to this vision or this goal that's where I think is kind of like the magic sauce Mm -hmm. for me. I'm like, okay, like that's exciting. And I can like start to see, you know, things come to fruition or things start to fall together. Okay, let's see. Jan asked, how can I set my business up to pivot? I have been doing VA work, but I am shifting my offers. Okay, so she wants to pivot from VA work to something new. Yeah. yeah, I think that that's, that's such an interesting question. I feel like actually a lot of people I know are pivoting their business mm-hmm. in this season. So it's very interesting to see, you know, someone else doing that as well. So um, I would suggest that the first thing that you need to kind of evaluate is your website, because this is your like virtual storefront. This is where when someone new is coming to you to find out what you do and who you do it for and how to get in contact with you. This is where you need to start shifting your language or where you're driving someone to. So if it is your new offers, I would really start first with your virtual storefront, because if you want to pivot into a new service, you want new clients that need that service. And before you actually start trying to find the clients that want that service, or even pitching your current clients to purchase that service from you, I think the best place is you got to have a place to showcase what it is this new services or new offerings that you have and have a way to describe them and pitch them and showcase a portfolio that is relatable to those services as well and any testimonials that you have as well to go along with that. Mm -hmm. I think when it comes to pivoting, you need to first get really clear with what it is that your new offer is, what is your new services so that you can then talk about it and start using your client finding strategies to drive traffic to your website and start getting clients clients purchasing your new services. That would be my suggestion, kind of step one, and then sort of see how things go from there. And as you start to land clients. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's great advice. And I think just communicating, like there's obviously a reason you're shifting from VA work to a different offer. I think the more, you know, if you do have a following, doesn't matter how the size of it at all, but like uh, following on Instagram or current clients, then I think just communicating like, Hey, over the past X amount of time, you've seen me as this, and I've been doing this. And this is, you know, in that 
journey, I realize I'm extremely passionate about this particular offering. This is my expertise with it. You know, kind of like, it's very similar to like launching a business even on day one. It's just, you need to, again, re-communicate that to people as well. The only thing I would avoid is just having people, you know, come to your website one day and be like, oh, whoa, like she doesn't do VA work anymore. It looks like she's, you know, doing this other random and it's only going to yeah. seem random right. because they didn't know, right? It's not random yeah. to you, but you're like, oh, now they're randomly doing this. So, so I think funny. the more that you can share that, then it will just make the transition since you're talking about the pivot, right? We're talking about people who already mm -hmm. follow you. If people come after you've pivoted, then they probably wouldn't even know maybe that you used to do VA work. So I would also say that transition, I don't think is as complex as, you know, you might be making it out to be. I think it can really mm -hmm. be as simple as like Shay said, adjusting you know, what is on your virtual storefront, on your website and your messaging, of course, and then just communicating that to people. You know, I think that it's, it ends up being fairly straightforward there. And then following those same strategies that you had for finding clients into, you know, take those lessons that you've learned to then be able to book out your calendar or book out your services or programs for your new offer. I would say if it's something that is vastly different that you don't already have clients for, maybe as a suggestion to, there is a bit more of a balancing act in the transition where you keep up, you know, a handful of your VA clients as you shift to this new offer. And again, I, I say that primarily for like something totally different that like going from VA work to like life coaching and you don't have any clients yet in life coaching. And instead of feeling like you're starting from ground zero again, you know, like, okay, like now I'm not making any income because I need to like go out and find clients who want life coaching, for example. I think that it could help out financially to you know, it can't hurt to keep up a handful of VA clients as you start building up your life coaching business, for example. Now I would say if it's like general VA work to website design, I don't think you'll have that same, like you can most likely be able to tap into your current client database in order to attract clients for website design work. So I think if it's fairly similar, you won't really have that big of a shift. So I think it depends on that too, but there is nothing wrong with giving yourself some runway. Shay and I have done this multiple times in the past of wanting to set up yeah, a new arm of our business or tap into when we had our, our first businesses and even Buckle of was something we worked on on the side as we maintained our clients because that was still what was you know bringing an income. Building our passion project wasn't yet bringing an income um, and so that obviously adds a whole nother level of stress when you're like this new thing also needs to work financially. And so anytime you can like pave yourself some financial buffer, especially if you already have current VA clients, you can always just cut down to your favorite clients or even one client maybe so that you still have time and energy to be able to focus on building this new business that you're pivoting towards. I think that's also like there's no need to like jump ship either. <laughs> there's nothing Nothing wrong with that as well. So yeah, I, I would definitely recommend that too. All right. Trisha asked, what is the best way to level up your skills when you have a general background? Yeah. I think that a lot of us reach this stage, especially in the service-based entrepreneurship world, when we get started, or at least for me, I'll just speak to my own experience, is that I was very generalized. I would take anything under the sun that fell into virtual assistant because I was just super determined to get this business off the ground. And I felt very confident I could do whatever it took. But then as I started working with clients and I started finding that I really enjoyed doing website design and project management for online coaches, that's when I started doing, which is what I'm going to recommend to you is I started niching down and specializing mm. in the skills that I had. So instead of being so broad with my services and having generalized skills, I started really honing in and like perfecting my website design and my project management skills. I still wanted to do two things. I just, um, that's just who I am, but I definitely like niche down and specialize my website design 
design skills really combined with the project management, or I should better maybe put it as sales funnels because it was, I was doing their front end work. And then I was also able to keep them on as a long-term client doing their back end work, managing all of the funnels that I had set up and all the operations that I had set up for them that I ended up having a very specialized niche package and service, and also a very specialized niche um, audience, a specific, and then a specific online coaching audience that I was then able to tap into and get referrals and sort of build off of that. So to sort of take it back, sorry, to your original question of having generalized skills and sort of what to do next to develop a deeper expertise is out of those generalized skills that you have, which of them are you most passionate about kind of niching down and specializing in and finding some online education and finding projects that you can like experiment and get more skilled at, take on different types of client projects that are at that next level so that you can implement and learn and grow, but also experience on the job as well. Um, Getting really like niche down into creating less of like um, intermediate skill level in a bunch of different things and a really like expertise skill level in like one, two, three things. Mm. I love that. I think when we see niching or specializing at the end of the day, it's either what you're sharing, you're either specializing in an industry. So like you were saying, Mm -hmm. online coaches, or you're also specializing in a tool or a platform, right? Mm -hmm. So you can, you know, we see people who specialize in email marketing, but specifically in active campaign or people who specialize in website design, but specifically in show it, right? That is Those are all tools and platforms. And then I think another layer, whether it's combined or not, is an industry. You know, people want to work when we're talking about specializing or leveling up, then you want people who understand the ins and outs of your industry. And like Shay was mentioning, online coaches have unique pain points, unique needs, unique ways that they set up their programs and their funnels that would be totally different to someone who is a realtor, for example, right? Like it's not to say that you can't learn that, but if you're like, Hey, I'm a project manager for realtors, that's how you niche down. And I think the other part of the question was like, how do you level up? I think there it's just the doing, right? It's like, okay, if this is an industry that I want to know about, we chatted about podcasts earlier, chatted about reading books, or there's a platform that you that's new that everyone is using in this industry. And you're like, okay, great. I'm going to familiarize myself with this platform. You can look up YouTube videos. You can take an online course. Like when it comes to leveling up your skills, I think it is just getting in there, (laughs) you know, getting in there and start learning, learning the ropes really. But I loved your advice too, is like figuring out, you know, what, which way do you want to niche and specialize? And then it just becomes, I think from there, it just becomes easy. It's just a matter of doing and trying things out. And that's usually where we see niching is like an industry, a tool or platform. Our last question, since we are running down on time here, is from Brie. And she said, do you have advice on getting the inspiration to pick back up on the travel dream? COVID has killed my fire. First of all, I love that this is such a like such a real question because I'm like, yes, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I mean, it was. It was like a, before, when I, when I came down to Mexico, what, like six months ago now, I had to have a little push from the loved ones in my life, to be honest, because I would agree with you. I was a little like, and I used to travel, Cass and I have been traveling for seven years and I was. I I was hesitant. I was, you know, we kind of talked about this earlier. I was sort of stuck in the bubble that I was in. It's just like the comfort zone bubble that I I feel like my comfort zone got really small and travel is the reason I loved it so much is it pushed me outside my comfort zone and I would grow as a person. And I used to relish that I used to want that all the time. And then it's sort of when I was thinking about moving, I got back into that, like, well, that comfort zone of like, well, I don't know the area. I don't know the language or I don't know. It's just 
I don't even know, honestly, I don't even know what the questions were that were running through my head. It just, I had so much resistance, even though it was also, it's going to sound really strange. Like it was something I wanted to do, but then as soon as I wanted to do it, I had like resistance. And so I think when it comes to like getting inspired to pick back up the travel dream, I think when you go online, it feels very exhausting. There are, you know, maybe there's rules that you're kind of like, I don't know what the rules are going to be, or I don't know what the actual place is going to look like now, because there's all these, it feels like there's just a lot of unknowns and travel just is not promoted the same way anymore. And I even feel travel bloggers don't even promote it the same way. But I think when it comes to getting the inspiration is just remembering that that is how it worked before. There's just a different layer now. And that everybody I've talked to who's traveled had those same kind of setbacks and fears or or unknowns of, okay, well, what are the rules? And it really just came down to, okay, what are the rules? Because I felt like I was making it this like big thing in my head. And I just like looked them up and I was like, great. Okay. These are the three things I need to do before I get on the plane. And these are the one thing I have to do when I get off the plane. Great. That just kind of took that COVID killing the fire, so to speak, kind of off the table. I was like, great. I know what I need to do. And that feels really great. And then when it came to the inspiration, I went on to Pinterest, to be honest, I went on to Pinterest and I looked up the city just like I used to do. I just, I followed the steps that Cass and I used to do. We would research the city that we were going to. What are like the best spots to eat? Which neighborhood do I want to live in? Like, what is the community like? And I just started getting a lot of that reminder inspiration, like the little feelings in my heart kind of like trickled back in. And I was like, Oh, I see myself at this cafe. And I see myself doing this adventure thing. The visualization of it for me was really what got me inspired seeing the visual parts of like, the life that I used to live and the things that I wanted to do. And that is really what got my fire started. But the first part for me for when it came to the COVID stuff was I was really hung up on the rules and the regulations that I hadn't even like left my small town since like the start of COVID, so to speak, or I was in Vancouver and that was like my little circle and bubble. And for me, just really like acknowledging what they were, like just looking and being like, okay, these are the things I need to do and I can do them. I used to have to do strange things to get into other countries sometimes like you know they all they had rules before it's just a new list of those rules and then just really seeking out inspiration from there are people doing it so I just started I went back on Instagram I went to Pinterest I went to find the people that were already there doing it not in the pre-COVIDness in the post-COVID kind of season of travel and that was really inspiring because I read these blogs and I saw this stuff and I was like, oh, there's people there. There's people doing it. And I want to be one of those people. And so it was almost removing any sort of preconceived ideas of what travel was. And it was almost embracing a new type of travel and being open to that and being like, okay, like these are the new the new ways of travel, which I think have actually become slower. Like the people I meet here are not here on just quick trips. A lot of people are here for a longer stretch of time. And I think that's been really cool to, I feel like the communities that are the people that used to travel are now traveling and they're building different communities around the world. And that really inspired me once I even got on the ground, to be honest, I still was like a little, was nervous on the plane, like a nervous excitement. And I was like, okay, I'm doing this. I felt literally like Because the first ticket I booked when I started this lifestyle was here to Playa del Carmen, which is so funny because I'd actually been here before and I still got on that plane and I had like a nervous, like I had a nervous energy. I was kind of nervous. And then I got here and then I became even more inspired just by touching down and just like being here as well. So I know that's not very helpful for pre advice on getting inspiration, but I still like, I just want to let you know, like, don't feel if you're on the plane and you're still kind of like, what am I doing? Like, I'm a little bit nervous still like, that's okay. I felt that way. And then it really just kind of started to dissipate as I got here and started doing the things that I said I wanted to do here. So I hope that helps. I love that. I think starting small too is like, you know, COVID is, you know, without getting into that whole conversation, but you know, it has obviously 
I feel like it's killed lots of people's fires in so many different directions, right? And so if you're trying to pick back up on this like massive vision and dream, you know, where you were like, I wanted to travel to like all these countries and this and that, it's not to say that you can't do that. I still think that's very much a valid dream, but like, how can you have a baby step towards what it is that you're wanting? You know, maybe you can plan a weekend trip somewhere. It doesn't have to be maybe even going to a totally new country, but how can you go somewhere Maybe that's only like a road trip. Maybe you plan like a weekend road trip or a weekend getaway. And like I find with travel, you get that like hit and excitement again of like being somewhere new. And I think your courage is like, okay, like I was able to figure this out. I just like found the coffee shops and I talked to people and I met new people and like you get you get out there you know you you get the the buzz of life again and i think you know COVID has definitely killed that and so i think the more that you can just kind of start getting your feelers out there again and start getting that feeling again even from just booking like a little trip a weekend trip somewhere it was kind of like we were sharing earlier with networking and and connecting and you're like oh it wasn't all that crazy that i was working it up to be again you know it was actually like super simple and like this was so fun and then you get an idea for the next trip and so i would say like do what she said, like plan your next weekend getaway somewhere that you haven't been before. And you can use Pinterest and you can, you know, look up places you want to eat, little adventures you want to go on, places you want to explore, like start small and do that. I think that the best way to start getting inspiration is to stop, you know, sitting on something and not giving COVID any more, you know, power than it's deserving to to squash your dreams, you know, like Shay said, people are out there, people are traveling, people are doing things. And I think, you know, we have to pick back up and that starts by doing and it's awkward and weird, especially if you feel, you know, it sounds like you feel unmotivated, which I think is a very common collective feeling, right? So it's almost like it's extra energy to do something when you Mm -hmm. feel unmotivated. So if you can start small, maybe you can even plan like a little trip with a friend, you know, maybe another friend that's kind of been feeling like that. Like, okay, you guys can share the effort of planning and it will just be like even more fun and exciting. Start small, I think is how, I feel like that's like a theme now for this episode is like start small, take baby steps in so many areas that obviously, you know, just so many areas that I think are people are wanting to pick back up and start doing again. Like we're all like, we want to do this, right? We don't want to feel like our life is on pause or business is on pause or vision for our lives. But it's weird and awkward after so long of isolation or being sedentary that I think it's just starting to like you were saying earlier, like putting one foot in front of the other is like back to basics. It sounds so like not revolutionary, but it's like, how can you just put one foot in front of the other? And then you're going to remember what it was like to walk. And then when you start walking, you remember what it was like to run. And I think, you know, you don't just get up tomorrow and go run a marathon, right? (laughs) Like we got to start retraining ourselves, what it's like to connect, what it's like to network, what it's like to pursue your dream, what it's like to travel again. And like you said, Shay, I think it's super fitting. Like we traveled for years, <laughs> years and years. We lived abroad and even we have felt like this, you know, over the last two years. And so whatever it is that you're picking back up again, whether it's a dream or something that you were doing before and you're ready to keep up back at it, I think we've seen this collectiveness. I think it's time to take that first baby step. The Freedom Filled Life podcast is brought to you by The Bucket List Bombshells. It's hosted by me, Cassie Torresias, and my co-host, Shay Brown. If you loved today's episode, we'd be so grateful if you left us a review. Reviews help us spread the word about the Freedom Filled Life podcast, and they're a key part of sharing this show with other women who believe they're made for more. Until next week, keep on pursuing your own freedom-filled life.